Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome, I am Dr. Chaya Chande and this session is on food poisoning. Now food poisoning is a food bone illness. It is result of eating food which is contaminated, toxic or spoiled. Now food poisoning is not at all unusual. However, the true incidence of food poisoning is not known because most of the time the cases of food poisoning they are sporadic, they are not diagnosed or they are not reported. Now the food can get contaminated at the various stages with the agent which cause food poisoning. It can get contaminated right from at the time of production to processing. The objectives for this session are like this. At the end of this session, you will be able to define what food poisoning is. You will be able to describe the etiology, pathogenesis, clinical manifestations and laboratory diagnosis of food poisoning. You will able to describe how to investigate an outbreak of food poisoning and how to prevent food poisoning. Now food poisoning is defined as an acute illness which is caused by ingestion of food or a drink which is contaminated either with live microorganisms or their toxins or by inorganic chemical substances or poisons derived from plants or animals. Foodborne disease outbreak is defined as the occurrence of two or more cases of a similar illness resulting from ingestion of a common food or the observed number of cases of particular disease exceeds the expected number. A wide variety of microorganisms and toxins can cause foodborne disease. Now let us first see what are the various organisms or toxins which can be transmitted through contaminated food. There are large number of bacteria which can be transmitted through contaminated food. The gram positive organisms include Staphylococcus aureus, Bacillus cereus, Clostridium perfringens, Clostridium botulinum and Listeria monocytogens. There are large number of gram negative bacilli which can contaminate food like Shigella species, Diriogenic E. coli, Vibrio cholerae, Vibrio parahemolyticus, Vibrio vulnificus, Compilobacter jejuni, Salmonella species, Yersinia enterocolitica and Aeromonas hydrophila. There are certain viruses which can also enter via contaminated food like norovirus, hepatitis A, rotavirus and hepatitis E viruses. There is a long list of parasites which can be transmitted via food. For example, protozoan parasites like Entomoeba histolytica, Giardia lamblia, Cryptosporidium species, Cyclospora catenensis, Toxoplasma condi. These are the protozoan parasites which can be transmitted via food. There are certain nematodes like Trichinella spiralis, Trichuris trichura, Ascaris lumbricaides, Anisakis species. Then there are certain trematodes like Clonarchis sinensis, Fasciolus busci, Paragonismus, etc. Certain cystodes like Tinea solium, Sajanata and Echinococcus granulosus, they can also be transmitted via food. Now besides this microorganism, there are certain other toxins which can cause foodborne illness. Now for the purpose of differential diagnosis, it is important to mention these toxins which can cause illness. For example, there are certain seafoods which can cause foodborne illness. Shellfish like uh, bivalve -vale mollusks like mussels and oysters, they can cause food poisoning. Ciguatera poisoning, it can be caused by reef fish which, which contains ciguar toxin. Tetrodotoxin, which is a neurotoxin which is caused by contaminated puffer fish and scromboid fish poisoning occurs because of consumption of spoiled or decayed 
uh, fish which contains histamine. There are certain heavy metals which can also cause food poisoning which are also poisonous like mercury, copper, arsenic, lead and thallium uh, food poisoning. Certain organophosphorus pesticides and toxins produced by fungi like mycotoxins and mushrooms they are poisonous. So, there is a long list of microorganisms which are transmitted via food like viruses, bacteria, helminths, uh, protozoa etcetera. However, it is customary to exclude many such infections from the category of the cases of food poisoning. For example, bacteria like Vibrio cholerae, Shigella species, Yersinera enterocolitica etcetera, they are usually excluded from the uh, food poisoning. Also, the disease that are transmitted by food, but where the primary symptoms they are outside the gastrointestinal and neurologic systems also excluded. So, the diseases like brucellosis, anthrax, bovine tuberculosis, toxoplasmosis, hepatitis A, which do not have primary symptoms which are gastrointestinal or neurologic, they are also excluded from the uh, cases of food poisoning. So, the term food poisoning is commonly and conventionally used when disease occurs in the form of outbreak as a point source epidemic. The exposure of to the disease agent has to be brief and essentially simultaneous. The resultant cases they all develop within one incubation period and there is no propagated spread, spread that means a person to person transmission by an infectious agent does not occur. So, when these conditions are fulfilled then only that condition is conventionally called as food poisoning. Bacteria which are responsible for food poisoning for example, Staphylococcus aureus, Bacillus cereus, Clostridium perfringens, Clostridium botulinum, Salmonella species, Enterohemorrhagic E. coli and Vibrio parahemolyticus. So, the term is conventionally restricted to acute gastroenteritis due to presence of bacteria usually in large numbers or their products in food. Clostridium botulinum is the only exception which is responsible for the neurological symptoms which does not cause significant gastrointestinal symptoms. It will be discussed which will be on bacteria causing central nervous system infections. So, let us begin our discussion with a case scenario. Now, the history is like this, four students staying in a hostel, they were brought in an emergency department of a tertiary care hospital with the severe symptoms of uh, abdominal cramping, vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness and headache at about 1 in the morning. The students after their, their evening meals at the hostel mess at about 8 pm had eaten cream filled pastries at a nearby bakery. They had eaten their meals on the previous two days in a hostel mess along with the other boys. None of the other boys in the hostel had similar symptoms. Since all the four boys had similar symptoms within same incubation period, this was considered as an outbreak of food poisoning. And since no other stu students in the hostel had any symptoms, the common food that is pastry which was consumed by these four boys was incriminated as a cause of uh, food poisoning or as a common source. For confirmation of this, the following samples were taken. The fecal samples and vomitus were collected from these four cases. The samples of suspected pastries including the ingredients which were used for preparation of pastries like milk and cream were collected. The samples from the persons who were involved in the preparation of the pastries were also collected. So, the samples collected from these persons were uh, nasal secretions. The samples were placed in a steward's transport medium and transported to the laboratory for further processing. In the laboratory, the samples were processed for detection and isolation of bacteria. So, these samples that is fecal samples, vomitus and nasal secretions, they were seeded on 5 percent sheep blood agar and mannitol salt agar. The plates were incubated 
for 24 hours at 35 degree centigrade. On blood agar, the colonies compatible with Staphylococcus species were isolated. The colonies were smooth, circular, golden yellow in color and they were beta hemolytic. The gram stain smear of the colonies showed gram positive cocci in clusters. So, the isolate that is suspected Staphylococcus was characterized by biochemical reactions like catalase test, tube coagulase test, mannitol fermentation and DNA test. The analysis of pastry sample showed presence of Staphylococcus aureus at a concentration of 10 raised to 8 organisms per gram of pastry. All the Staphylococcal isolates were also subjected to typing using procedures like fast typing, molecular typing and also the enterotoxin was detected in these isolates by ELISA test. The strains isolated from the samples of incriminated pastry, the strains isolated from the fecal samples of the patient and the strains isolated from the nasal secretions from a person who was involved in the preparation of pastry showed 100 percent similarity. So, this particular outbreak was labeled as, a, as an outbreak of staphylococcal food poisoning. So, basically there are three types of bacterial food poisoning. One is toxic type where there is a toxin which is already present in the food ingested. So, in toxin type ingestion of food in which toxin has already been formed is taken along with the food. The examples are Staphylococcus aureus and Bacillus cereus. There is another type of food poisoning which is known as infection type where the organisms are taken in with the food and they multiply in the intestine. However, they do not spread, spread to a distant site and they remain confined at the site of uh, entry that is they multiply only in the immediate vicinity of the intestine. In between these two there is an intermediate type of food poisoning where the toxin is released in the bowel by the bacteria that do not produce toxin readily in the food. So, the toxin is not produced in the food, but the organisms they are taken up with the food and the toxin is produced in the intestine by the organism and this type of food poisoning is caused by Clostridium perfringens. So, on the basis of incubation period and clinical manifestations, we can classify food poisoning into three groups. For example, in the first group, the incubation period that is a toxin type of food poisoning, the incubation period is short because the food contains ready made toxin. So, for such type of food poisoning, the incubation period is of 1 to 6 hours and the most predominant manifestation is vomiting. The, the case that we have seen that is a food poisoning because of Staphylococcus aureus, this it falls in to this type of category. Another type of food, another bacteria which causes this type of food poisoning is Bacillus cereus. In the second type of food poisoning which is known as intermediate type, here the incubation period is about 18 to 16 hours and the most important manifestation is diarrhea. The organism responsible is Clostridium perfringens and some strains of Bacillus cereus. In third type that is infective type, the incubation period is more than 16 hours. The predominant manifestation is diarrhea. It could be bloody or non-bloody type of diarrhea. The stools are loose and there is presence of fever and abdominal cramping. The organisms which cause this type of uh, food poisoning are Salmonella, Vibrio parahemolyticus, Enterohemorrhagic E. coli. So, first we start with Staphylococcal food poisoning. Now, as we have seen it occurs after the ingestion of different foods which are contaminated with Staphylococcus aureus by improper handling of the food and subsequent storage of the food at elevated temperatures. The symptoms are of rapid onset, it includes nausea, vomiting, diarrhea may or may not be present and illness is, is usually self limiting. 
staphylococcal food poisoning is an in intoxication that results from the consumption of the food which contains sufficient amount of preformed toxin. Now, the foods which are frequently incriminated in staphylococcal food poisoning meat and meat products, poultry and egg products, milk and dairy products, salads, bakery products, cream filled pastries and cakes, sandwich fillings and ham. Now, the staphylococcal food poisoning is because of the production of enterotoxin. Now, the staph aureus it produces wide, wide variety of toxins including staphylococcal enterotoxins. There are different types of staphylococcal enterotoxins identified staphylococcal enterotoxin A to E, G to I and R to T. So, many different types of enterotoxins have been identified, but enterotoxin A is the most uh, important or it is the more most often incriminated in food poisoning. Staphylococcal enterotoxin A, it is resistant to heat, it is not affected by boiling at 100 degrees centigrade. So, even at higher temperature, it remains active. It, it, is, it remains active at low pH, not affected by acidic pH and it is also not affected, affected by proteolytic enzyme. This enterotoxin is produced by staphylococci during lo logarithmic phase of multiplication. How is the mechanism? How it acts? Actually, staphylococcal enterotoxin it stimulates the vagus nerve in the abdominal viscera, and it transmits the signal to the vomiting center in the brain. It is also said that staphylococcal enterotoxin is able to penetrate the gut lining, and it activates local and systemic immune response. And because of the local secretion of the inflammatory mediators that may result in the vomiting. So, by these two mechanisms staphylococcal enterotoxin induces vomiting. Now, man is the most important source of staphylococcus aureus. The incriminated food often contains organisms more than 10 raised to 6 gram of food. Food is usually contaminated by food handlers. The food handler may be a nasal carrier or may carry staphylococcus on their hands. About 20 to 50 percent of the normal population carry Staphylococcus aureus in their nose. The lesions such as boils, carbuncles, whitlows, they are also present as a foci of Staphylococcus aureus. Fast typing and other typing methods, they are extremely useful for tracing the source of outbreaks. These typing methods will able to establish the similarity between the strains which are isolated from the uh, food and the strains which are isolated from the clinical cases and also from the carriers. So, the molecular methods of strain typing which are commonly used for Staphylococcus aureus are pulse field gel electrophoresis, sequence based typing and DNA fingerprinting. The another type of common food poisoning is food poisoning caused by bacillus cereus. Now, bacillus cereus causes two types of disease syndromes. The first syndrome is diarrheal syndrome, it is also known as long incubation form syndrome. Now, this is due to production of heat labile enterotoxin during the growth of vegetative cells. The infective dose in case of this form of illness is about 10 raise to 4 to 10 raise to 9 bacilli per gram of food. Now, this syndrome manifests by abdominal cramps and diarrhea. It is a mild illness and usually it is caused by serotypes 2, 6, 8, 9, 10 and 12. The another form of illness caused by bacillus cereus is emetic type of uh, emetic uh, syndrome or short incubation form of food poisoning. Now, this is more severe and acute as compared to diarrheal syndrome. It is characterized by nausea and vomiting and abdominal cramps and it is caused by serotypes 1, 3 and 5. Now, the bacillus cereus it is transmitted by the various foods like rice, milk products, grains, pasta, chicken, cake, vegetables, meat, 
and sauces. The pathogenesis of Bacillus cereus food poisoning is because of a toxin known as ceruloid. Now, this toxin is responsible for the short incubation type or emetic type of syndrome. Ceruloid, it is highly heat resistant, it is acid resistant and also it is resistant to proteolytic enzymes. It is preformed when ingested in the food and because it is already present, there is a rapid onset of syndrome and the toxin it forms ion channels and holes in the membranes of the cells and responsible for its action. The diarrheal form of illness is mediated by heat labile diarrheogenic enterotoxin. It causes secretion of fluids in the intestine by pore formation and activation of an enzyme adenyl cyclase. For laboratory diagnosis, the suspected food, feces and vomitus, then they are cultured on culture media like blood agar or mannitol, egg yolk, phenol, polymyxin medium. There has to be presence of 10 raised to 5 bacilli per gram of stools for diagnosis to confirm. Bacillus cereus, it produces large colonies with granular structure and beta hemolysis on blood agar the colonies typically have fimbriated edges. On gram stain, gram positive bacilli are seen from the colonies. For the identification of bacillus cereus, certain biochemical reactions are to be done. This organism, it is motile and non-capsulated. It is arginine dihydrolase positive and it produces lecithinase in aqo agar. The another type of food poisoning is Clostridium perfringens food poisoning. So, it is one of the important agents of food poisoning which is usually transmitted by consumption of food like beef, chicken, pork, gravy and turkey. The, the manifestations of Clostridium perfringens food poisoning include abdominal cramping, diarrhea and typically there is foamy, foul smelling stools. This is a self limited illness and recovery occurs within 2 to 3 days of onset. The clostridial food poisoning is, is typically caused by ingestion of cold and warmed up meat dishes, which is contaminated with large number of clostridium perfringens bacilli. Now, it is seen that for during clostridium perfringens food poisoning, the food is prepared well in advance. It is allowed to cool slowly and then it is maintained for a long duration at room temperature. The spores which are present in the meat, they resist boiling or cooking, do not get killed and they sporulate to form vegetative bacilli when food is kept at uh, room temperature. The vegetative bacilli present in the food they are ingested along with the food and these bacilli, they undergo sporulation in the intestine in the presence of alkaline environment. During spor sporulation, the toxin is produced at the time of lysis of the parent cell. The toxin, it binds specifically to the receptors in the epithelial cells of the small intestine and it causes disruption in the transport of ions in the jejunum and ilia. It alters the permeability of the cells and this results in diarrhea. For laboratory diagnosis, it is important that spore counts of 10 raised to 6 or more should be there in 1 gram of feces and that should be collected within 24 hours of the onset of symptom. Stool sample should be collected within 24 hours of the onset of symptom show presence of 10 raised to 6 or more spores per gram of feces. The quantitative anaerobic cultures of implicated food should demonstrate presence of vegetative bacilli more than 10 raised to 5 in number. The serotyping of isolates recover, recovered both from the feces and the food is done to demonstrate the similarity between the isolates. The enterotoxin can also be demonstrated in the feces using 
immunological test like reverse passive latex agglutination. So, either by demonstration of so spores more than 10 raised to 6 or demonstration of enterotoxin can be done for diagnosis. Identification of Clostridium perfringens can be done by various uh, characteristic. It rapidly it forms rapidly growing colonies on blood agar. Good growth is seen in Robertson's cooked meat, meat medium and double zone of hemolysis uh, is seen on blood agar that is because of two types of hemolysins produced by type A Clostridium perfringens strains and it is a non-motile capsulated bacteria. So, the smears of the colonies shows presence of gram positive bacilli, the spores they are not very well uh, seen in the smears prepared from the colonies, sporulation does not occur in vivo or in vitro readily in case of Clostridium perfringens. It is a saccharolytic, so pink discoloration of meat particles occurs in Robertson's cooked meat medium. In litmus milk, it ferments lactose and produces large amount of gas. So, typical stormy fermentation of litmus milk is seen. Clostridium perfringens type A strain, it produces lecithinase C, which is responsible for the opacity which is seen on the media, which contain egg yolk or serum. So, when Antitoxin is mixed in the medium, the opacity is inhibited and this is known as Negler's reaction. So, Clostridium perfringens type A strains can be identified by Negler's reaction. The Clostridium perfringens type A strains can also be identified by reverse CAM test. So, at the for this Streptococcus agalacti is strict at right angles to the stick of Clostridium perfringens and arrow shaped hemolysis is produced and the head of the arrow it points towards Clostridium perfringens trick. So, this is reverse CAM test. So, all these tests help in the identification of Clostridium perfringens in laboratory. Besides this Clostridium perfringens also produces another type of illness foodborne illness which is known as enteritis nec necroticans or pig bale. Now, this is caused by Clostridium perfringens type C strains. Large number of Clostridium perfringens grow in intestine and secrete ex exotoxin and this exotoxin it causes necrosis, hemorrhaging and perforation. There are typical risk factors for this particular condition. There has to be protein deficient diet, the food is cooked under unhygienic conditions. There are sporadic feasts on meat that is high protein diet is taken sporadically and diet contains large amount of trypsin inhibitors. So, under such conditions Clostridium perfringens produces exotoxin in the intestine. This is seen only with type C strains of Clostridium perfringens. Next very important bacterial food poisoning that is Salmonella food poisoning. Now, non-typhoidal sal salmonella is very important cause of food poisoning. The food which usually transmit salmonella are raw and undercooked meat, poultry and egg products, dairy products, uncooked vegetables and salad. The common manifestations are fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea, with passage of mucus and pus in feces. Salmonella most commonly involved is Salmonella typhimerium and Salmonella enteritis. Besides this, many other serotypes of Salmonella are also involved like Cholera Suisse, Hadar, Hedelberg, Agona, Virchow, Septenberg, etc. For laboratory diagnosis, Salmonella has to be isolated from feces and implicated food. But in case of Salmonella food poisoning, typically it is seen that it is very difficult to isolate Salmonella from the implicated food because usually when patient becomes symptomatic, by that time the food is always disposed of because of longer incub incubation period. And so, it becomes difficult to correlate 
between these two that is isolation of salmonella from food and isolation of salmonella from the uh, clinical cases. For isolation of non typhoidal salmonella the enrichment is done in tetrathionate broth or selenite broth and for isolation various selective media are used like besides McConkie agar, deoxycholate citrate agar, salmonella shigella agar and xylose lysine deoxycholate agar. The identification is done by various biochemical tests like fermentation of various sugars like glucose and mannitol, growth on C1 citrate medium, indol and methyl rate test, production of H2S and test for decarboxylases. Finally, the, the serotyping is done using seroagglutination. So, first seroagglutination is done with polyvalent O anti serum and then depending upon biochemical reaction salmonella type specific O factor anti serum is chosen and then seroagglutination is carried out with salmonella H specific anti serum. For typing of salmonella various phenotypic and genotypic methods are available. The phenotypic methods include fast typing, biotyping and antibiogram typing. Genotypic methods like insertion sequence 200 typing, pulse field gel electrophoresis, ribotyping, random amplified polymorphic DNA and restriction fragment length polymorphism. For example, for identification salmonella typhimerium, let us see how it is identified. So, salmonella typhimerium which is the commonest agent of salmonella food poisoning, it forms non lactose forming colonies on McConkie agar. It is indole negative and it is methyl rate test positive. It can utilize citrate and urease is not produced. On TSI that is triple sugar ion agar, it produces large amount of H2S. It ferments glucose with production of gas and mannitol is fermented. So, for final confirmation carboxylases like lysine decarboxylases and test for ornithine decarboxylases are carried out. And the final confirmation is done by seroagglutination with polyvalent anti serum, O4 anti serum, and then HI that is H specific anti serum. The another important bacillus that is gram negative bacillus, which is often incriminated in food poisoning, is enterohemorrhagic E. coli O157H7. Now, the various food which are involved in transmission of the organism includes hamburgers, ground beef, poultry products, uncooked vegetables, cheese cut and sprouts. The disease manifests manifest in the form of abdominal cramp, cramping, diarrhea, stools which, became, which become bloody after 1 to 2 days of onset. It is often associated with fever. Now, the pathogenesis is because of the production of toxin known as shiga like toxin. Two types of shiga like toxins which is also known as verocytotoxin they are produced by enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Shiga like toxin 1 and 2. Shiga like toxin 1 is exactly similar to the toxin produced by shigella dysentery type 1. Now, this toxin it particularly has affinity for the endothelial cells and it causes microangiopathy and that is why it is responsible for the complications associated with hemorrhagic E. coli O157 H7 that is hemolytic uremic syndrome. For laboratory diagnosis the virotoxin or shiga like toxin it can be directly demonstrated in feces by ELISA test or the organism can be isolated in the laboratory using sorbital McConkie agar and the toxin production can be demonstrated in the isolates by molecular test. The other mechanism by which the toxin production can be demonstrated is the cytotoxic effects on vero cells or HeLa cells in the laboratory. Vibrio parahemolyticus is again an important cause of food poisoning. It usually causes food poisoning associated with the marine food. So, it is 
widely distributed in sh shallow coastal waters and contaminates fishes like raw fish, shellfish, cooked prawns, shrimps, crabs and oysters. So, consumption of this type of food can result in Vibrio parahemolyticus food poisoning. The manifestations are like this, usually there is watery diarrhea and rarely there can be dysentery with abdominal cramps. The pathogenesis is bec probably because of two virulence factors, one is the capsular polysaccharide of the organism and second is hemolysin produced by the organism. For identification of Vibrio parahemolyticus in the laboratory, this organism is a gram negative bacillus, it is motile by presence of peritrichate flagella, it shows bipolar staining and it is pleomorphic. It can tolerate concentration of salt up to about 8 percent. On TCBS, it forms colonies which are green colored because of because it does not ferment sucrose. The colonies they are opaque and raised in center and the colonies typically have translucent periphery. The identification of the pathogenic strains of Vibrio parahemolyticus is done by a test which is known as Kanagawa phenomenon. This test differentiates between the environmental strains and pathogenic strains. So, the pathogenic strains they are usually hemolytic on high salt blood agar which is known as Vagat sumagar, whereas environmental strains they are non-hemolytic. So, these were the various bacteria which cause food poisoning. Now, coming to the laboratory investigations which are done during food poisoning. So, the first important thing is isolation of causative agent from the human specimen. The second is isolation of the same agent from the incriminated food or uh, implicated food source. And then we have to demonstrate that, that there is a similarity, similarity, the strains isolated from the human specimens are exactly similar to the strains which are isolated from the implicated food. So, various methods or typing methods are used for typing of the strains. So, these are phenotypic methods like biotyping, serotyping, antimicrobial susceptibility profile and fast typing. There are certain genotypic methods like plasmid profile, pulse field gel electrophoresis, ram random amplified polymorphic DNA and restriction fragment length polymorphism. So, these typing methods help to establish the similarity between the strains. The various objectives for the investigations are like this, why we investigate an outbreak of food poisoning to verify that there is an there is really an outbreak of illness and to verify that the causative agent was indeed food bone to determine the nature of the causative agent and to identify the food stuff by which the organism has been transmitted. It is also done to ensure that all the cases have been identified to ensure that all the carriers of the agents are identified and to stop the outbreak if it is continuing. So, the various steps in the investigation of an outbreak of food poisoning are like this. One, the first thing is to secure the complete list of sufferers. Also, the list of the persons who have consumed the food but are not symptomatic is also uh, prepared. The clinical histories are obtained from both symptomatic as well as asymptomatic persons and a list of food consumed is prepared. The mode of preparation is recorded and how the storage of food was suspected food was done is also recorded. The various specimens are collected for laboratory examination and the, the material collected is the actual food consumed. The clinical specimen from the sufferers like vomitus and feces and stool samples and rectal swabs from the food handlers or nasopharyngeal swabs or if the skin lesions are present on the food handlers, the specimens are collected from these sites. Now, coming to the management of food poisoning, the treatment of patients with food poisoning usually includes uh, 
reversal of dehydration. Usually, these food poisoning uh, cases they are self limited and usually only rehydration therapy is enough. So, in case of mild dehydration, only oral rehydration is sufficient, but in case of severe cases, IV fluids can be given. Antibiotics are usually of limited utility and they are not indicated in most of the cases of food poisoning. So, coming to prevention, so one has to take all these precautions to prevent the occurrence of food poisoning. So, washing and sanitizing all the surfaces and equipment which are used for food preparation. The hands should be washed before handling food. It is very important to separate raw meat, poultry and seafood from other foods. The food should be stored in containers, so that there will not be any contact between raw and prepared food. The food should be cooked thoroughly, especially food like meat, poultry, eggs and seafoods. And if the food is reheated, it should be reheated thoroughly. And the cooked food should not be left at room temperature for more than 2 hours. So, to summarize, we can say that ingestion of food contaminated with bacteria or their toxins can cause food poisoning. Ingestion of food contaminated with preformed toxin results in food poisoning with an incubation period of short duration. Staphylococcus aureus, Bacillus cereus, Clostridium perfringens, non typhoidal Salmonella, Vibrio parahemolyticus are the important causes of food poisoning. Investigation of an outbreak of food poisoning is required to identify the incriminated food and most bacterial cases of food poisoning are self limited, hence antibiotic treatment is usually not required. Thank you.